Hello SBC family. For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Foster and I'm honored to be here to share with you a glimpse into just one day of the whole Passion Week. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rides into an environment that is fully expecting a triumphal Messiah and he does not disappoint the people. On Monday of the Passion Week, Jesus makes clear through the story of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple how people of Israel and especially the leaders were not raising up Israel and were failing to be a light to the Gentiles. Jesus and the disciples have spent the night in Bethany and were on their way back into Jerusalem when Jesus spotted a fig tree along the road. And as recorded in Mark 11:12, he, Jesus, was hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf. Now a unique characteristic of a fig tree is that it bears two crops, one uh, in April when it first blooms and one later in the summer. Another unique characteristic is that the fig tree is actually in full leaf, full flower, and full fruit all at the same time. Thus, Jesus seeing the tree in leaf expected to have fruit. Given to us by Mark's account, when it came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now why would Jesus doom a tree that would not have figs on it? If we look further into the Bible, often a fig tree holds symbolic importance. From the picture of the promised land, to what the spies brought back, to even peace and prosperity for the man towards the end of his life to be able to sit under his own tree. But it also has been the wrath of God. What we see here is an idea of promise without performance. The fig tree being a metaphor for Israel. Israel's outward display of religious vitality was impressive. Like the leaves on a tree, it bore no spiritual fruit of righteousness. It was hypocritical. It professed to bear fruit, righteousness, but it really did not. Jesus, in condemning the fig tree, was condemning the fruitlessness of the Jewish people, turning from true worship of God to fruitless ritual and legalism. Monday starts out with Jesus passing judgment symbolically on Jerusalem and Israel through a fig tree. Resuming the story at Mark 11:15. We read that, And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Now let's paint a picture of the temple first to better understand what happens and why Jesus has one of his fiercest manifestations of anger. The temple is set up into four courts. The outermost court, the court of Gentiles. Anyone was allowed here, but death be on this point to a Gentile. Next was the court of the women, which was open to all Israelites. Third was the court of Israelites, where majority of temple services were held. And the innermost court, the court of the priests, were only accessible by priests, and it held the great altar and the holy of holies. The cleansing of the temple took place in the Gentile court. This is where the market was set up, the money changers, the animal vendors. Now by law, every Jew was required to pay half shekel temple tax that had to be paid in a specific currency. This tax was paid around the time of Passover and thus a necessity for those traveling to exchange their currency for that of Jewish or Tarian currency. As with most money exchanges now, there was a fee. But also there was another fee if it wasn't exact money, allowing for exploitation of travelers. The greater abuse was the selling of pigeons. An animal could be found at a fair price outside the temple, but the animal had to be without blemish. And the temple inspectors almost always found fault, thus forcing the people to buy from the vendors inside the temple. Now this wouldn't have been such a bad deal if the price inside the temple wasn't almost 20 times that of the same animal outside the temple. And then to make matters worse, the stalls where all this took place were private property of the family Annas, who were of the high priest. Now to add to this, Mark has an oddity in verse 16, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. What Jesus is referring to here is the practice of using the outer court, the Gentile court, as a shortcut from the eastern 
part of the city to the Mount of Olives, turning part of the temple into a thoroughfare, a commute. Both of these incidents by themselves angered Jesus. The exploitation of travelers, worshipers, the reverence of the temple and a place of worship. But I believe we get a deeper, better picture of what upset Jesus to the point of his fiercest show of anger. Look at verse 17. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house should be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus is quoting from Isaiah 56, 7. And I want to focus on that part of the quote. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Jesus condemns these grievous acts as robbery. But imagine the lack of room, the commotion, the disorder, the absolute chaos taking place in his father's house. This, this hindrance to the ability of those who came to worship, even those especially those who could not go deeper into the temple courts. The simple people coming to pray and worship at God that they may not fully know. And this was being made impossible by the actual people of God. Jesus, God, will never hold guiltless those who bar others from coming to know and worship Him. This is what set in motion an act that was a direct challenge to the authority of the Jewish leaders in their most sacred place. An act that made it possible again for everyone from all nations to come and meet with God. Now what does that have to say for us today? We see throughout the Bible this idea of fruit being a manifestation of a true authentic relationship with Christ. Church, there are some hard truths for us in the fig tree. There are some that go to church every Sunday, are involved in a small group, maybe even serving. They are full of leaves, but have no fruit. Now so much more that there is no church to go to, to be seen at. How many of us during this time are full of leaves, but are bearing no fruit, that have promise, but not performance. So what does the church look like now? What will the church look like when we're able to gather together again? Who will have withered just as the fig tree? The zeal of Jesus was for true worship, which outflowed in the passion, cleansing of the temple, should lead us to examine ourselves in two ways one internally and the other externally. During this unprecedented time of quarantine, where so many things in the world can create chaos, what are we allowing to get in the way of our worship of God? And how are we getting in the way of the Gentiles, the outsiders, of coming to a full relationship with God? What are the money changers and pigeon vendors in our lives that are hindering a focused worship of a Messiah who is not afraid to live boldly, putting himself on a path that ultimately led to his death, so that even sin and death would not be able to stop us from coming to worship a loving and holy God.